Hello, everyone. My name is Natalie Turvey. I'm president and executive director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our first JTalks Live of the season. We're delighted you could join us for these important conversations on media issues that affect all of us. We're grateful for the generosity of our exclusive JTalk series TD series sponsor TD Bank Group for making these conversations possible and our thanks to our in-kind supporters CPAC Incision. If you would like to support the work of the CJF, you can do that uh, by following the link on your screen uh, to make a donation or by visiting the CJF website. And if you'd like to tweet about today's conversation, our hashtag is JTalksLive. Our show today is one hour long and a reminder that you can submit questions for our speakers anytime via the tab on your screen. Before we get to our program, September 28th is World News Day, a day to celebrate the power of journalism to affect change. Presented by the CJF and the World Editors Forum, this year's event will focus on the vital role journalism plays in providing us with all the facts to act on the climate crisis. Our program is hosted by actor Victor Garber and global news anchor Farah Nasser and will showcase media coverage of climate change issues, activism, and solutions from around the world. You can visit our World News Day site to find out more and to tune into this virtual free event on September 28th. Now on to our program. In the lead up to the 20th anniversary of the September 11th, attacks and on the back of the West's chaotic exit from Afghanistan, our guests today will share their thoughts and experiences on the lessons learned over two decades and the challenges that persist when it comes to newsroom practices, editorial decisions, and media coverage. Joining us from Portland, Oregon, Omar al Akkad, novelist and journalist whose career coincided with the War on Terror. His latest novel, What Strange Paradise, is long listed for this year's Scotiabank Giller Prize. Welcome, Omar. In Toronto, we have Michelle Shepard, journalist, author, podcaster, and filmmaker who's covered issues of terrorism and civil rights since the 9 11 attacks. And welcome Nazim, uh, Nazim Baksh, a producer with the CBC's The Fifth Estate, who's worked extensively on issues of national security and violent religious extremism. And Shanaz Karmali, a freelance writer who teaches journalism at Ryerson University and University of Toronto. We're honored to have them with us today. Leading this conversation, please welcome our host, Anna Maria Tremonti. Well, welcome everyone. And um, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Just a reminder again, you can send in your questions and we will have time at the end of this conversation for questions. Um, I wanna go around the Zoom link um, to get each of you to tell me an anecdote that illustrates what you were experiencing or the challenges you were facing as a journalist or leading up to a journalist because of 9-11. It doesn't, it could be that day, it could be months later, but but the thread begins on 9-11. And I wonder who wants to start. Um, Omar, why don't you start? So I was, I was uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. It's an, it's an honor to be here with these exceptional journalists. Um, I was in college, I was starting second year, um, and I woke up, checked my email, and there was an email from a high school friend who was down in university in New York, saying, hey, everybody, I just wanted to let you know that I'm okay. And I thought, well, that's strange. Are you going to gonna send this email every day? I had no idea what was, what was happening. And then I went to TV and, um, and immediately sort of got that sense of the world changing. Um, and a few weeks later was actually when I signed up for the student newspaper. Um, I, ha I had that sense of something, something happening that I wanted to, to witness as it happened um, and, and ended up sort of immediately not realizing how much of a knowledge base I brought about a part of the world that to me was home, but to everybody else was a sort of exotic context. Um, that was my entryway all the way to the Globe and Mail where I ended up being hired. I, I was hired on as a summer intern and then I was hired full time, I think four days before the Toronto 18 arrests, which ended up being sort of the biggest story in Canada for, for, um, a year, two years, something like that. And again, it was this notion of looking around a newsroom 
and thinking, okay, how many people in this newsroom of 300 have any expertise, not even expertise, but experience with the Middle East, Islam? There were two of us. There was me and there was Kamel, the theater critic. And it, it sort of puts you in this position of feeling very far away and simultaneously very close to a thing, which was a, it's still a, a, something I have trouble contending with when I do this kind of journalism. Shanaz, talk to us about what that day, how that day spun out and affected you. Hi, Anna Maria. Thanks. Um, yeah. So on that day, I, um, I, I too just, uh, I found out. I, I just was, I was turning. I was at home, and I was. Um, this was after I finished my undergraduate degree, and I was at home, and um, I just, I turned on the news and couldn't believe it, like everyone else, what was happening. Um, and the days and months and years that followed were were pretty awful for me. I mean, I felt very conflicted both as a reporter and as a Muslim. And I think that that feeling of being of, of being conflicted, um, you know, it, it manifested itself most for me when I moved on to the UK after that, and I did my graduate studies. I was studying. Um, I was doing my masters in Middle Eastern studies and politics at SOAS, a school in central London, and I was. Um, and I was walking towards the King's Cross station one day in July 2005. And um, there were huge crowds outside. And that's when we realized, you know, many hours later that, that the July 7th terrorist attacks had taken place that morning. And I was like minutes away from stepping on one of those trains. So, you know, it really hit me hard then, um, knowing that I had been so become so close to being a victim of a terrorist attack, especially one that followed 9-11, as horrific as 9-11s. The, the July 7th terrorist attacks were like London's own version of 9-11. Um, and so, after that, I, you know, I, I was determined to kind of report on the story, and um, I just, by sheer luck, I think I got access. Um, I was given the opportunity to interview the wife of the ringleader of the July seventh terrorist bombings, and um, and so I made my way up to where she lived, and I spoke to a, a bunch of people from Dewsbury, the community where he was from, three hours north of London, and again, that those feelings of being very conflicted really manifested for me because um, I was greeted with a lot of despair and um, fear from the community there and also suspicion towards me, um, you know, of somehow people thought that I was part of the FBI or like somehow, you know, was uh, some kind of player in trying in, in kind of like provoking the, the media into um, putting out very harmful images um, of Muslims and Islam. And uh, they felt that, you know, through the questions I was asking, I was perpetuating that. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I also felt very upset and angry at the terrorists, obviously, um, having been so close to, to being, like I said, a victim of that. So it was a really difficult uh, time for me as a Muslim. And I think um, many Muslim reporters would probably uh, speak to having those same feelings or, and experiences. And I want to explore more of that as the years have gone by. Um, mm -hmm. But let's keep going around right now. Um, Nazem Baksh. Yeah, well, um, I was at the CBC working on a show called Dispatches uh, with Rick McInnes Ray when 9-11 happened. And I just finished reading a book on Ramzi Ahmed Yusuf, who was, you might remember, or maybe not, um, ancient memory now, he was the mastermind of the first World Trade Center attack in 1993. And he had been captured in Pakistan and tried in the United States. And he's at a supermax uh, serving multiple life sentences. And I just finished reading the book. And one of the things that struck me was uh, Ramsey's word to the FBI agent uh, when he was transported to court was that uh, the FBI agent pointed down at the Twin Towers and said, uh, to him, they're still standing, right? And Ramsey said, for now, we're coming later, right? And when 9-11 happened, a thought hit me, what well, these guys don't stop, you know? Uh, this, is, this is remarkable. Without evidence, I didn't know what was going on. I just kind of like put the two together. And 
you know, just kind of feeling this, this feeling within me that this is, this is the long haul. These people don't go away. And, uh, and then it, within a day or, or, or 24 hours, it was confirmed that Al-Qaeda and uh, Osama bin Laden had planned uh, and, and carried out the attacks on 9-11. So that moment of, of kind of having read that book, and it was a pretty substantial book on Ramzi Ahmed Yusuf, and having just finished it in the summer, and then this happened, um, I mean, set in a pattern of, of a kind of the stories that I would do for the next 20 years. Before we get to Michelle, um, I just want to say, if you're trying to put in, uh, submit a question and you're not seeing the question tab on your screen, please um, refresh the page and then you should be able to see where to put the question tab. Michelle Shepard, go ahead. Hi. Uh, well, I was uh, at the Star at that point. I was a, a 29-year-old crime reporter and part of the team that the Star sent down. I was the junior on the team that went to New York. So we we drove there that day and got across before the border shut and down to ground zero as that night as pieces of the tower were still falling. And, you know, from, <laughs> I wish I was as well-read as Nas, or I had the wealth of experience that, you know, Omar brought to it. But I think I, what I brought to the story at that time was a lot of ignorance. <laughs> I was, a, you know, been covering the, the bloods and the crypts right before that. I kind of was reflective, I think, of a lot of people who just kind of looked up and thought, what, what happened? <laughs> you know, what, what is going on? And from that moment, really forward for the next 20 years, uh, it was, it was a, it's been a steep learning curve. Um, but I think what was really instructive about being there and covering New York for, you know, the weeks that followed was I really, I can still recall that trauma and that fear. And, um, you know, if you remember after that, there were the anthrax scares and there was this talk that there were going to be more attacks, more attacks, more attacks. And you watch the way the politics capitalized on that fear. Uh, and so I think for the next 20 years, so many of the decisions that were made, so many of the mistakes that were made were just um, based on fear. It was the politics of fear. So having actually seen it and, and, you know, we'll never forget that day. I always say there's so many horrible images that came out of that. Um, but the one thing that really struck me was the paper. And it was, you would walk around where the towers had fell and there would be these snowdrifts of paper. And it was, you know, the, the reports, the, the bills, all the very important work that we do daily of these two towers. And now, you know, as I always say, it was just sort of this insignificant debris of the, the dead. And that collective grief reverberated for a very long time. It's so interesting to hear all of you talk about that, all of these things, because we're talking about um, identifying sort of the journalism, the, the emotion and the pain of the place where it happened, but then also uh, following the thread to, to uh, the origins of, of who did that, and then trying to figure out where that fits. And, and at a time when our newsrooms are still not diverse enough, but we're even less diverse, where in fact, we had so few people in newsrooms who could, who could, were proficient in the languages needed, who were proficient in understanding the areas, um, and not even understanding who the players were. You know, I had a book called Taliban by Ahmed Rashid. And I was with the fifth estate when, um, when 9-11 happened. And I brought the book and I had already read it. It was on my shelf. And I had been a Middle East correspondent and they took the book and they sent it down to some department and they copied it for every staff member on the fifth estate because you could not buy that book. It flew off the shelves and it wasn't a popular book. There were only a few copies probably anywhere in town anyway. But that was just like everybody trying to catch up, even though, of course, the Taliban had been in the news and we knew about the Taliban, but we didn't all of these connections we had not made. Um, and then um, I, I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of the, the, the as, as people went forward reporting and, you, and you've already talked, Omar and Shanaz and Naz, you've already, you, you've, you've touched on the idea of being conflicted. Um, and um, th there was, I want to hear a little bit more about that. And then I want to, I want to also hear about conflicted as journalists because 
people started to take sides, I think, in journalism in a way we had not seen in North America, because suddenly this was a story in everybody's backyard in North America. It was no longer something at arm's length. Um, but talk to me first more about the being conflicted. Nazem, do you want to start? Well, you know, I, I, I mean, conflicted, I, I was traumatized, and I agree with Michelle in, in many ways, because I knew that the public, uh, having done several of these kinds of stories, starting with my career in 1990, and then the first major documentary I did was with, it's called, you know, uh, Seeds of Terror. And, you know, I traveled to Afghanistan, I had worked on several big stories at that time involving Islamic extremists. But I knew that people were not going to look at the extremists and understand them. They were going to look at the entire Muslim community. And there was going to be some stereotyping going on. To this day, people still think if they see a burqa or a beard, uh, mm -hmm. much like mine, mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, maybe this guy is so devoutly religious that he's got uh, violent ideology. Uh, it, it, they were not able to sort of understand what was giving shape to that violent ideology. And I felt like my role in the very first commentary I did for Michael Enright on the Sunday show, um, which I'd never done before and since, I've never done another, another commentary like that, basically was to point out the, the distinction that, sh that was clear to people like Omar and Shinaz and Michelle and you, Anna Marie, that the vast majority of 1.6 billion Muslims in the world are not like this very narrow street of a few individuals that are hell bent on committing violence. And, and I, I felt like that is a battle. That is a narrative that has lived with me for 20 years and will continue probably living with me so long as I'm a journalist. And Naz, you tried to, you wanted to interrogate your own community on this issue. And yeah. You, you're you I mean, a wall on that too. I mean, they, they, people came to me and they said, well, why don't you become more like Michael Moore and tell those kinds of stories, you know, uh, as if, uh, you know, by, in, by focusing on highlighting and perhaps also kind of, you know, shining a light on, on the violent extremist and what exactly they believe and how did they come to this point? Uh, people were saying, well, you're doing the wrong thing. And I think Shinaz also uh, faced the same issue. Umar, I know, definitely uh, had the same kind of challenges where there were people in our community that was pushing back. And I have, that's my entire career. I mean, I, there are certain mosques in Toronto that I know I'm not welcome and probably I will not dare to go. I mean, I'm not ashamed to say that. It's, it's a frustrating, uh, damning, traumatizing, fearful experience, but it's the truth. Omar, you want to you want to uh, pick up on what he's saying? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly agree with all of that. There, there was an element of, of loneliness to it. Um, so, like I said, my, my sort of career at the Globe almost coincided directly with the start of the, the Toronto 18 case. And I spent the next two years of my life on that story. And there's the, the loneliness of being, you know, the one guy who's, who's sort of, you know, Michelle talks about this say, oh, my expertise. It was not expertise. It just happened that I happened to have lived a kind of life that made this stuff not feel very far away. Um, and one of the examples, uh, which relates to my own cowardice at the time, was, you know, I, I had, I'd stopped being an intern three weeks earlier. And at the Globe, for example, if you ever go back and look at the footage of the first day of trial, I think it was up in Brampton, um, the New York Times was there, CNN was there, it was this massive story, and there was all this coverage of the, um, the accused and their relatives, the relatives coming into the courtroom, and these women were wearing hijabs, or in some cases, niqabs. And the reporters on the story repeatedly used the word burqa. They're wearing burqas, they're wearing, and, and, and you're reading this, I'm reading the copy in the system before it goes, and I'm thinking, well, this is wrong, this is just incorrect, this is not what they're wearing, and I'm far too terrified to say anything about it. Um, and finally, it was Mark McKinnon, who's an incredible journalist, one of the finest journalists I ever, I ever worked with, who was, at, I think, in, still in the Middle East Bureau at the time, who sent an editorial-wide email saying, hey, this is wrong. It's just like, you need, you need, to, get, you need to get your terms right. Um, he had the seniority to do it. Um, and I was terrified to do the same thing. You couple that with 
the sense of being in a nowhere place as a, as a reporter, uh, by which I mean, you know, like Nazim was talking about this notion that I would write a story and then I would get emails from certain community members in, in various Muslim communities in Toronto calling me a traitor. Um, I wrote a story about uh, the federal government's PR push in the wake of the Toronto 18 trial. Uh, I got access to these documents. And the first comment on the online story was from someone saying, I don't trust any story about terrorism written by a guy named Omar. Um, and that was one of the less sort of toxic things that showed up in the comment section. Um, so it's hard to find ground. It's hard to find a place from which to project any sense of certainty about what you're doing, even when you see things that are glaringly obviously wrong, um, like the, the issue of just getting terminology wrong, for example. Uh, and you can see, on the other hand, that there's really not very much consequence to getting this stuff wrong. You fast forward to today, if there's a, a drone killing of a wedding party and a Western newspaper says that 13 people were killed instead of 14, there's very little consequence to that kind of wrongness. Whereas there would be huge consequences if you had a similar magnitude tragedy in this part of the world and you got 13 instead of 14. Um, so seeing how the difference in consequence and the difference in reaction um, was a very sort of lonely experience. Who wants to add to that? Um, I guess I would just say that, you know, that both of those um, feeling, both of those sentiments expressed of loneliness and like being shut out of mosques and by people from your own community, that's, uh, I, I went through the same thing in, um, in England, you know, in the communities that I, that I uh, in the north that where a lot of where at least a couple of the um, where the bombers where the suicide bombers came from um, when I went around asking questions I can't tell you how many times uh, people from my own community Muslims slammed their doors on me as soon as I identified myself as a reporter I didn't even tell them where which publication I was from um, when I said you know, I'm a journalist and I just want to speak to you about what happened last week, you know, with the with the bombings in London, they shut the door. Um, how many times I got told off for for being a woman um, entering a community, an Islamic center or mosque premises, asking questions that they thought were too um, sensitive, you know, for not being empathetic enough when actually all along I was I was actually trying to kind of get the other side of the story. Um, not that there was, you know, another side to the like to the bomber's perspective in terms of a rationale or justification, but just like trying to find out where this came from, where these uh, sentiments of like anger and aggression really stemmed from. You know, trying to get to the root of it. And we all know now, and we we suspected then, although I think nobody really wanted to talk about it at the time. Um, that U.S. foreign policy and interventions in the region over the last few decades had a lot to do with it, right? Um, but there was still this uh, this very like um, deep grained suspicion that that lingered, and I think also um, internally there was a big discussion in the Muslim community that went on for many years about how apologetic or uh, empathetic, we should simply like, empathetic. We should really be as Muslims. You know, why are why does it seem like we're like we need to apologize for stuff like this, or you know, um, uh, you know, we shouldn't. We should be. We should just. You know, we should not kind of fall into the trap ever, that the media was kind of like laying out in 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 in. Um, stereotyping Muslims as all terrorists. I mean, you know, we don't do the same with like white terrorists, right? Who who are white murderers who who attack buildings and who go on shooting rampages. We we don't even classify them as terrorists. So why should we kind of fall into that trap that the media, quote unquote, was putting us into? Um, I, then this just leads right into um, some other questions I have, um, and that is how we. Um, I, I'm wondering about what we've normalized since 9-11. Um, maybe we should start with language, but also in the way we cover um, things. Um, and we're looking at Afghanistan now. And I, I, you guys have lots of ideas. I'm just, I'm gonna throw out a couple of ideas there. Um, the embedding of journalists with the military at the level that it's happened. Um, security advisors who go into the field now with journalists, um, the killing of journalists Journalists have always been killed in the field. I think we saw other things 
um, since 9-11. Um, and then the language, the use of the word who's a terrorist and the language of who's extreme. Um, Michelle, um, you want to talk a little bit about how you've seen words change? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we spent so much time thinking about how we would um, headlines, how we would describe certain events. And I always say the two big T words were terrorism and torture. And for, for many years, um, the stories that I covered were, you know, extraordinary renditions, um, the and Guantanamo. And it took us a long time to uh, write what was happening was torture. And I remember having these discussions that we, um, for a very long time, we would use the Pentagon's term, which was enhanced interrogation techniques. And I would always push back on that because that was, you know, by definition, what was happening was was torture. And it, it took, a, I would think it was probably till about, till about 2009, really, until uh, Obama came in and had that sort of famous speech where he said, we, to we tortured some folks. And after that, it started to go and in slip into the lexicon. But, but that took a very long time. Uh, and just mentioning Guantanamo, and I know Omar and Naz can, can add to this as well, because we've all been there. Um, but that was the, the most spectacular example of Orwellian language that you've ever seen. And um, they, they just had a whole different definition for everything that was happening there. So just a couple examples would be um, the insistence on the use of calling those who were there as detainees. And it was because they didn't want to call them prisoners because if they were prisoners, they could be classified as prisoners of war, considered prisoners of war, who get Geneva protections. So for a very long time, and, and I fell into this too, I think my stories, I would write detainees till finally you, you think, well, they're locked up. This really looks like a prison um, and started to you know use prison as language. The other one, which I am certain I never used except in jest was um, the Pentagon's use of the word reservation. Um, a detainee would be going for a reservation. And what that meant was an interrogation. And so I think we, you know, later that became a bit of fodder for the ridiculousness of the place. But you would have these tours there where you, <laughs> this whole other language would come out. And, um, and I think for, it took us a long, long time to, to get over that. So, you know, I think if I were to go back and forensically look at articles, you know, even ones that I did back then, you could really see a change. And it makes me think that for a period until we kind of figured it, that out, we were a little bit part of the, the problem, um, part of the, the, the perpetrating of some of the stereotypes and, and in this effort to get both sides of the stories. Um, you weren't calling a lie a lie, and you weren't using the right language to tell what was really happening. We still use um, the euphemisms when we quote police um, as a, as a, a, a by rote, right, in the media. We, we use the language, and it's cumbersome, but we use that. And it's interesting that that persists even when people realize some military language should be replaced with the real word. Um, especially because our police are far more militarized today than they were 20 years ago. I think there's a lot of similarities. And just, just to touch really briefly on your question of uh, in, embedding too, um, I never did that with the exception of Guantanamo, if you consider that an embed. Um, but I think that's that's part of the issue too. I, I know it was neat, it, by necessity, um, some of the reporting had to be done that way. Uh, but I was sort of thankful that I never had to do it myself, only insofar as I think you start to, when you become part of that, you're actually kind of part of the team. So I've, you know, some of the rep the reporters who were embedded a lot, I would kind of giggle at because they would start to sound like military themselves. You know, it's like, well, we got, we got wills up, uh, you know, at almost 700 hours and we got to be careful of the OPSEC. And I'm like, you're talking like a soldier now. But I mean, that's, that's the kind of, you know, when you're immersed in it and you're relying on these people, quite frankly, to keep you safe, it's understandable how that happens. But journalistically, sometimes you have to be very aware of it or it can become a problem. You know, I always believed that being embedded had its place because you need to cover the military. And the way to do that is to actually follow them through. But I also always believed you needed somebody on the outside to give that other perspective or those other perspectives, right? Like, uh, if anything, something as massive as 9-11 and the wars that followed and the, and the social change that followed 
required a team and required teams that were guided by really insightful news bosses. I, and I, but I think news bosses fell down as well on some of that. But you needed all of those things. I don't think in Canadian media, we actually had a lot of defense reporters before 9-11, like actual beats. I don't think we still have enough defense reporters post 9-11. And I don't understand how that could possibly be. Mm. Um, so when you look at some of the things that happened, um, I, I, go ahead, Nas, you wanted to jump in. No, I mean, you know, I, you know, there's a certain, I remember when Umar, Michelle and myself, <clears throat> we were in Guantanamo and, you know, I, I was, I was scared. I got to tell you that. I mean, you know, I don't report like I'm, you know, you don't see at that time we weren't writing articles. I was producing. So I'm sort of behind the scene. I'm not like Omar or Michelle, where you actually can see their names in a byline. I'm a sort of, you know, I have, I'm a maverick. I, I have opinions and, and they were talking to us like we were idiots and, you know, you're on an island and, and not only that, you know, I'm brung, I'm a brung Muslim man who, you know, I mean, over that hill, you've got at that time probably seven, eight hundred of, of people that look like me, talk like me. And so they were talking to us in a way that was very derogatory, very racist, uh, very condescending, um, inferring jokingly, you know, that, you know, maybe you're one of them. Um, and, and then we have to ride that wagon because we need to be polite and, and, and civil and to get the quotes or access that we need. Otherwise, these guys, man, they might just shoot me. That's what I was thinking. You know, so, I mean, when you're talking about embedded and, and, and doing that kind of reporting, uh, sometimes I just have to look at myself in the mirror and say, go easy, fella. You know, um, this is dangerous work. And I felt really, really frightened at times. Uh, and the three times I've been, not as many times as Michelle or Umar, but I, I have been there three times and I was really, really intimidated in the times that I was there. And of course, there was blowback from the, the public when you produced your work. Michelle, going to, to, to Gitmo, reporting on Omar Cotter, not everybody wanted you to. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't compare to, to some of the, the pushback that other, our other three panels have had, for sure. Um, but no case was as controversial as the, the Cotter case, and we had to get the police involved a couple times. Um, and I think most famously, I had an article returned to me, which had been used as toilet paper. Um, at the time, I was just delighted that people were still reading print newspapers and took the time to, to send it back. But, um, but yeah, it was just, I just think that case was so in, indicative of so much. And I mean, of course, it was just a very interesting, you know, sensational case of a 15 year old uh, Canadian who got caught up in this. But I think, but it just touched on so many elements of how the world changed after 9-11 and, and how so much of perspective was lost. And going back to that idea of the politics of, of fear, but um, I think, you know, if you took that case out of the context of 9-11 and put it in another context, Canadians wouldn't have been as divided. They wouldn't have reacted the way they had. Um, they would have understood that, you know, there's been a, a, someone we would classify in law pre-9-11 as a, as a child um, charged with murder in a war, which before 9-11 wasn't a war crime. Um, so, you know, there were just some sort of basic, basic um, ideals that I think uh, just got lost. Um, it's worth remembering that 9-11 dovetailed with or maybe spurred the creation of an explosion of technologies. Um, I'm thinking of the technology with more rapid communication, social media, sophisticated and nefarious surveillance opportunities, drone technology, a whole bunch of technologies that the public could use, that journalists could use, that state actors could use, and that non-state actors could use, that politicians could use, and that conspiracy theorists could use. How did all of that affect us going forward journalistically? 
That's a big question. I want who wants yeah, to, who wants to dive in there. That, 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 that sort of, you know, uh, surfaced for me uh, when I started covering ISIS recruits and getting, you know, sort of enmeshed in the in the coverage of ISIS itself, but as it relates to Canada. And, uh, you know, I mean, I used it to my advantage in many ways because it opened up a channel of communication that I uh, established with some of the recruits that left from Canada <clears throat> to go join ISIS uh, or other organizations, uh, and then eventually, um, you know, merging in, into, into, that, into that group. Um, you know, I, 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 but it was it was always tricky because you never know who is actually communicating with you. How can you trust uh, this person? Um, so it raised a whole level of 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 reporting or verification that was was sometimes very tricky and very difficult. Um, you know, because you, as Umar was saying earlier. You know, you, you make a mistake about someone in Pakistan or Afghanistan or in Somalia, uh, you know, maybe you don't get wrapped on a knuckle, right? Because that, that kind of mistake might fly under the radar. But you make a mistake about a Canadian and you get that wrong. That's a whole nother level of mistake. So, so you know, when, when I kind of sort of encountered the way these guys were using various platforms of social media and communicating and, you know, who can you trust? What, what is true or not true? You know, what is verified and not verified? Who's talking to you? And can you quote uh, and use that information that these guys are putting to you? And a lot of it was propaganda um, coming from, from their side. And, and the other side was not as helpful in terms of discerning what was truth and what was not. So a lot of it, the weight was left on on us as 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 a reporter, as a journalist, to figure out what is the truth. And as much as it helped, in some ways, it almost made us go backwards in terms of how we do our business too, because it became so difficult to ensure that you could protect sources anymore. Um, you know, you just always sort of had to have this idea that you could be surveyed, you could be watched, and so it it almost brought us back to having to meet people in person. Um, I remember one story. I had I got some intelligence about uh, Shabab, the the Somali group, and, uh, and this was in the days when we had more money to do this sort of thing. But I actually, you know, flew to Kenya and met somebody in person to get a thumb drive because there was just no way that we could ensure that that information could could be safely uh, given electronically, not intercepted, and that this person wouldn't be outed. Um, so there's it's it's really it's really complicated in that sense too. Shanaz, I know that hits on your um, your concern about the kind of reporting and foreign reporting or international reporting that doesn't go on anymore. That, like you know, what Michelle says in the old days, you could she could fly in and do that. Um, what, yeah. what do you see in terms of coverage that is just thwarted by how newsrooms parcel out their budgets or make choices on what to cover? Well, I think I mean. The foreign news coverage, to be honest, in Canada has never been that. Um, it, there, it's never really been, uh, foreign news has never really been covered in as much depth, I feel, um, from my own observations, as, as much as like other foreign press from the UK, for instance. Um, and so, but I think there are, I, I do think there are ways around that now. I mean, with with the obvious advent of social media. I mean, there's, you know, it's very possible now to get extraordinary footage of events happening in real time on the ground in different countries. You don't necessarily need to have foreign con correspondents there anymore. Of course, that is, it's always of great value to have people on the ground covering events, um, um, you know, from the perspective of, of the that reflect the values of your, of your news outlet. But, um, it's not, I mean, it's, what I'm trying to say is that it's not an excuse anymore to not cover foreign news in a really great way. You know, um, I think the, the lack of representation of, um, diverse representation in newsrooms lends itself to this. Um, I, I definitely see a difference in foreign news coverage from news outlets in Canada that have diverse newsrooms. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's also just like, 
goes back to what Nazim was saying, like you need to um, you need to be you need to really ensure that your reporters are fact checking the experts, you know, that they're speaking to, um, because it's I think Twitter, for example, is is a tool, indispensable tool that journalists use all the time to find sources, to find story ideas. And yet it's also a place that's rife with disinformation. And it's very, very easy to quote people uh, so-called experts, academic experts from think tanks and universities who actually um, do not offer nuanced perspec perspectives or even correct narratives um, on news stories. And uh, The Intercept has done a lot of work on this area, right? You know, um, and so I think, you know, I think it's it's really important to to educate emerging journalists in, in journalism schools, um, but also to have people come into newsrooms to talk about these types of things, you know, how social media is really leveraged by a lot of rogue players in, in a very problematic way. And I think journalists can can get roped into using those sources very easily, especially because we work under such tight deadlines. Paula, well, um, you know, I, I don't want to really disagree uh, with that, I think it's relative, and I, I just don't want to let the point slide that when a few months ago, when the Palestinian um, uh, uprising or, or protest against uh, Israeli occupation started in Jerusalem at the tail end of the month of Ramadan, uh, when Muslims were fasting, I felt uh, desperately that we needed to have a reporter on the ground. That no amount, I mean, I was watching this, as you, as you rightfully said, in real time. Uh, through social media feeds, but you know, I can't, I, I'm in no position to verify whether the videos I'm actually seeing are not a year old, two years old. Somebody sort of, you know, took something out of context, dressed it up, edited it, put it together, put it on, and this happens all the time. That you needed, you know, and Anne Marie Tremonti, you, 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 you were, you covered Jerusalem. In fact, the first time I met you was in Jerusalem in 1999 at your house. And, and so I know you know that in that conflict, you needed a reporter and, you know, on the ground who that's the beat, that's the coverage, you know, you need because the context is important. You know, a verification is important. Uh, you know, reporting accurately beyond the talking points that politicians uh, raised on both sides of the equation was important, right? And I felt like we needed, like, no, we, we did not even cover that story for three days while bloodshed was, was taking place on the ground and brutality was taking place on, on both sides. But, you know, uh, to have a reporter there is vitally important. And, and I, you know, yes, for a storm, you know, Ida or something, you know, maybe you can get away with, you know, in the beginning, sort of covering it without, you know, having a reporter there initially, but a reporter is always, you know, much more plugged in than we could ever be, diversity and all. To Shana's point on the national security experts, I do think, sorry, just briefly. No, I go ahead, go ahead. That's, that's a, it is an excellent point because you, you especially saw that with, with national security, you know, so-called experts. And I, I used to try and have kind of a, an, an unofficial rule that I wouldn't quote somebody as a, you know, quote unquote expert, unless they'd at least step foot in that, that country. You know, you'd have these experts that would come on and they're talking about China one day and the next day they're talking about Yemen. And then the next day they're on to Somalia and, and you just see that a lot. And it is in part because especially on shows that have tight deadlines and you have this roster of go-tos, but so often you had, you know, some guy who spent a minute on a desk in CSIS and he's, you know, the top of these stories. And it was, uh, yeah, it was, that, that used to frustrate me when I'd see that in other reports. That's a really good point. There's uh, something else I want to bring up before we go to audience questions. And Shanaz, um, you talk about this with students. Um, and that's the use of the word terrorist and how we cover acts of terror and what we define as an act of terror. Um, you have a slide that you show your students. I'm going to ask if we can put that slide up and you can talk to us a little bit about what we're seeing and, um, and what this represents. Yeah, sure. So one thing I talk about when I um, when I speak to my students about covering um, covering communities and and covering Islam and, and well not covering Islam but covering terrorism and extremism is I always point to this data from the University of Alabama, um, which was published in 2018, and what it basically shows us is that there was a 350 percent increase in headlines um, that focus on 
um, uh, terrorist attacks committed by Muslims between the years 2006 and 2015. Um, 350 percent, 357% increase in, in stories about attacks perpetrated by Muslims. But during that same time period, the number of attacks by white terrorists and extremists um, doubled. So there's really what that really points to is that there's a disproportionate amount of coverage um, that centers and focuses on Muslim perpetrators. Right. And I think it, it just it goes back to our own like implicit biases and the associations that we always make internally um, between terrorists and Muslims. And did that start from 9-11? Can I just confirm I that know, we but... that uh, our audience can see that poster? Or are they seeing oh. that now? Yes. Good. OK, um, so. Uh, yeah. Keep going, Shanaz, keep going. So even what we identify, even who we identify in the media as a terrorist, yeah. which is a word, I have to tell you, when I covered suicide bombings in the Middle East, I never even used that word. I talked about acts of terror. I didn't characterize individuals because I understood the, yeah. um, the debate around who gets that phrase. It doesn't mean what they did was a good thing or doesn't mean I supported what they did. I chose to describe what they did and not label people. After 9-11, that word was tossed around randomly, but usually only for people whose skin was brown or who were Muslim. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. And still is, frankly. Like we, we, so what do we do about that as journalists? <laughs> Naz and I are working on a series about white supremacists right, supremacist oh, right now, okay. but, um, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think I think your last point is what is what you do. You 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 avoid these labels as much as you can. I mean, I think um, often in stories there we now have terrorist entity lists that governments designate, which you know we have just recently had some of the the neo Nazi groups added to that belatedly, um, and the Proud Boys as well. So I think you know you just be very specific in your language that it is you know a designated terrorist group. These are acts of terror. Well, there are, there, there are actually seven to five or seven to six uh, designated terrorist lists in Canada, according to a public uh, safety uh, website. Uh, six to nine of them are uh, people of Middle Eastern Muslim names. <laughs> you know, the, the rest are, I think there's one Sri Lankan on there and uh, five uh, white supremacist groups in Canada. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, as we talk about all of this, we are talking against the backdrop of what has happened in Afghanistan. And I'm wondering what each of you is thinking with that 20 year view of of everything. And then to see what has happened in the last two weeks in Afghanistan, of course, not just the last two weeks. That, that's when everybody trained their attention again on Afghanistan, and I, you know, some people always have, but uh, what's going through your mind? What are you thinking? What do we need to learn? How do we as journalists um, need to think about this going forward? I'll just briefly say, I think uh, for me, the biggest point was not, I mean, as gut-wrenching as what's happening right now is um, it came when the, the deal for withdrawal was signed under Trump and sort of the pronouncements in, in Doha that this was the greatest chance of peace we'd had for a long time. And I remember uh, back in 2001, when the Taliban offered to negotiate then, when um, you know, it was three months, I guess, after the bombing started and the Taliban spokesperson in uh, Pakistan, the ambassador to Pakistan, who later was captured and sent to Guantanamo, actually reached out and said, we will give up Al Qaeda. We will, we will, if you stop bombing, and if you let the Taliban leader not be put behind bars, we will we will get Al Qaeda out, which Al Qaeda, you know, perpetrated the 9-11 attacks. And Bush at that time said, you know, I don't think they heard us. We don't negotiate. So then to flip, you know, 20 years later and to have um, that same ambassador, he's no longer part of the Taliban, but he was in Doha and in the back room. But at this point now, you know, the Taliban had all the power and to have that essentially same deal be signed. I mean, that to me was just, just devastating, just devastating. As, um, 
Go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 no. you go ahead. Um, on on my first trip to to Afghanistan, I was I was in the NATO airfield, and and uh, it was my first time there. And at the time, it was sort of the size of a large city. I think it was twenty five thousand people or something. It was just massive sort of uh, complex. And we're driving out for the first time to, to sort of get out into Kandahar. And um, I'm, I'm taking a look at the layout of the base, and there's an inner wire and there's an outer wire. And the inner wire defends the base proper and is sort of manned by uh, by NATO troops, state-of-the-art equipment, training, et cetera. And then there's the outer wire, which is right on the highway. And that is exclusively uh, Afghan troops. These kids, I mean, some of them were 18, 19, no training, no body armor. But the nature of, of, the, of the setup was such that if there was going to be an attack, it was going to happen almost always at the outer wire. If there was going to be a car bomb or something, everybody knew that there was a hierarchy of whose life was expendable and that the base was arranged in a certain way. And I think one of the sort of defining, and maybe the other panelists will disagree with me here, but one of, to me, one of the defining traits of the sort of post 9-11 war on terror age is the legitimization of, of these parallel realities. Now here was a parallel reality in which these human beings did not matter. So, and, and, Back on, in Washington, where the policy is being made, that parallel reality was not a niche thing. It superseded the actual reality that these were human beings who deserved maybe not to die at the rate of hundreds of thousands of human beings since the war on terror started. I was with Michelle when we were touring the, the, the Gitmo camps, and I mentioned the word prisoners, and immediately the, the soldier corrected me and said, we don't have prisoners here, we have detainees. Fine, but then you go back and look at the media package that they gave us with this little sort of like pleasant history of Guantanamo Bay. And you get to the last paragraph and it says like, you know, in 2003, the first prisoners were, they couldn't even keep track of the fantasy that they'd created. And I think that's going to be the longest lasting legacy of whatever this was, was the legitimization of parallel fantasy neighborhoods where you can believe whatever the hell you need to believe. Hmm. to get whatever you want done, done. I think that's going to continue into the Trump era, into COVID vaccines have microchips, into climate change isn't real. A lot of that was solidified during the, the war on terror years. And, and yeah. I genuinely don't know how you deal with that from a systemic media perspective, because it's right. such an overarching societal thing. Interesting. Well, and it's that's also that's interesting that's to note that uh, in Afghanistan, as we watch the Taliban take shape now as a government, that five of its senior uh, uh, government officials were former um, prisoners at uh, Guantanamo. Yeah. Um, so, and the person, Abdul Salam Zaif, who I met in 2009, uh, who's written the book on, um, on, on his experience in Guantanamo. In fact, he had offered me to edit his book uh, yeah. he's, he's also there uh, now back back on you know sort of the scene but but I'll just say this very quickly that for me watching this is that I in all my years as a journalist I have never seen a political is Islamist group uh, succeed at creating a government that is worth talking about uh, so I you know wish them well you know uh, see you later. We'll see what happens. Now you've, you know, you've fought for, for 20 years or 25 years to create a government in Afghanistan. And I think it will be the test of time. We'll see what happens. But I, I don't hold out much hope uh, in that we'll see anything less than the brutality that the Taliban is known for. Shanaz, what are you thinking? Um, on Afghanistan. Yeah, no. I would I would echo that hundred um, percent. I I don't I don't have any. Um, I just hope that I just hope that um, like journalists don't get roped into this new narrative that the Taliban is trying to construct in in saying that they are different, you know, and that they are reformed and progressive. The other day I saw Al Jazeera Plus um, uh, produce a video, like publish a video 
of a Taliban commander or leader who was who had a British accent and he was young and and he basically was saying, you know, we are quite inclusive now and we are going to include um, we are going to be accepting of Shia Muslims and Hazaras and um, other minorities and we are going to include women <laughs> in the governance of, of Afghanistan and you know, I, I just hope that my hope is that moving forward that journalists will inter continue to interrogate um, these claims and um, and uh, and yeah, and give also give voice to to the women in Afghanistan. I, um, I, I, I think. I oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I hope we keep covering it. I mean, so often what happens is, you know, once the Canadians withdrew, there was so there was way less coverage in Canada. But generally, like once now that all co coalition forces are out. I just worry that Afghanistan is going to kind of fall off the media radar again. Yeah. Well, hopefully um, journalists can make enough of a fuss to get um, keep making it um, a place where they can be sent by their news bosses. Um, uh, there are a couple of questions um, uh, that they dovetail into what you guys have already been talking about. So I'm going to kind of dovetail this question from Maria Iqbal and Larry Neufeld. Um, just... Um, with 20 years of hindsight now, is there anything you would want to not, it says, would you change, but just because we're really almost running out of time, what would you want to see change in, in journalistic coverage that didn't change or that, that was glaring? Is there anything like you, well, if you were talking to journalism students right now about how they go forward in covering this wide sweep that Omar's identified as, as the ongoing tale of what was created and how things have uh, uh, folded. Um, what would you want to tell a journalism student? Or anyone starting in journalism, I, even if they didn't study journalism? Yeah, I, I would tell journalists to beware of manufacturing uh, coverage that reflect or sort of get trapped in manufacturing the Muslim menace. You know, if, if, if just to avoid that trap, uh, you know, to sort of, as you sort of weigh in. And, I, you know, if I had to teach a journalism course, I would teach a journalism Islam 101 for new, newbie journalists. And, you know, just to get them around sort of sort of Arabic phrases and, and basic uh, nuance of the language, not to confuse, as Umar was saying earlier, you know, the hijab with niqab or burqa, you know, the, the sort of language stuff, basic elemental stuff, that many journalists struggle with and, and often, you know, confuse simple things. Uh, I would just say keep finding, journalism can find its way into so many different forms now and just find different ways to inform people. I feel like right now we're going through a phase that hopefully will, will not last, but of this great distrust of sort of mainstream media. So just finding ways to get, you know, your reporting out there. I love what Omar's doing. I'm so happy both his novels have been such an incredible success, but it's it's hard reading them because I, you know, I'm like, oh, he's borrowed that from Guantanamo. Oh, that's from the Arab Spring. But like his journalism is infusing his, his writing. And I find that really interesting. I mean, I know that's not facts, it's fi fictional, but there's a lot of really important themes that are coming out through his books. I just, yes. I just got tired of getting beaten up by Michelle every day, pick up the star and realize <laughs> right. how many times she's beaten you. So well, I, I was going to gonna say, picture. we haven't even touched on the refugee crisis uh, reality that all of this created too. And Omar, your, your latest book just reminds us just of the layers and layers of humanity at risk. And um, it's, it's just a really, it's an important reminder. Sometimes uh, fiction can tell us what a news story, let sink in what a news story won't allow. Shanaz, Oops. what would you are talking to students? What are you telling them? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I talk to them all the time. And I honestly, I feel like the one thing I'd want to impart to them is um, know your history and know your politics, but mainly know your history. You know, um, I feel like there's a lot of students that come in to, uh, or j forget about students, but journalists that just, you know, they learn the skills of the trade and the craft, but they don't know history, they don't know politics, they don't know economy. And you need to have that that backing, that, you know, that theoretical backing in order to do the job. It's enormously helpful. And it will help you to craft better questions and find better sources for your stories. 
Um, that and also I push them to really like interrogate, like find the right people for their stories as sources um, to give them the nuances, the nuance that they need in the context and to really interrogate them with the right questions. But again, that goes back to really like knowing the history in the first place, you know. Omar, did we get an answer from you or did I talk over you? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, you please feel free to talk over me anytime. The only thing I will add is, is um, I, I would say beware the road of least consequences. Uh, I think, you know, like Michelle talked about the idea of torture versus enhanced interrogation. If I write torture in my article, well, the State Department, you know, the Pentagon has a PR department. The guy getting tortured doesn't have a PR department. Uh, nobody's going to call my office yelling at me. And so I, I think, especially for younger reporters, it's so, so tempting to write the thing that will get you in the least amount of trouble. Um, and people tend to think of getting in trouble as like people are going to yell at you on Twitter. That's not the worst trouble you're going to get in. Uh, you know, posting something on Twitter about Palestine and then the AP fires you, uh, that, that's a lot more consequential. So I, I, would, I would urge reporters to show the bravery that I certainly didn't show much of the time um, and, and sort of avoid the road of least consequence, um, go after the story, regardless what could happen if you write it. We have to leave it there. Thank you, all of you, for your insights and uh, your comments today. Um, there's a lot to think about in, in what you've all told us, so thank you. Um, um, thank you for joining us for J Talks. And remember, we've got upcoming J Talks on October 14th. The death of George Floyd focused the world's attention on police brutality and the problematic practice of relying on official police accounts of events, something we did touch on. Um, my guests will be Karen Atia, a columnist of the Washington Post, Wendy Gillis, crime and police reporter at the Toronto Star, and Adrian Harewood, host of CBC News Ottawa at 6. October 28th, we'll be back with the question, what does it take to be a columnist in today's politically fraught environment? when a choice word or angle can be a landmine setting off a barrage of online hate. I will be speaking to columnists Daphne Bremham of the Vancouver Sun, Sri Pradkar of the Toronto Star, and Elizabeth Renzetti of the Globe and Mail. November 4th, I'll be speaking with Kathleen Kingsbury, the new opinion editor of the New York Times. All of these events coming up soon. You can stay updated on all CJF events. Visit the website, sign up for the newsletter, Follow the Canadian Journalism Foundation on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. And a reminder, you can find videos and podcasts of past talks on the CJF website as well. So we'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us today. Bye-bye. <laughs>